Please welcome to the stage, Jennifer Shuba, Senior Fellow at Wilson Center, United States. Moderated by Lawrence Jones, Senior Vice President for International Programs of Edison Electric Institute, United States. Welcome again to a new edition of EI International Program, Influential Mind. Today we're coming to you from the EI Global Electrification Forum taking place here in Washington, D.C. The Jeff began uh, two days ago on, Jan on April 17, and we're actually now on the third day of the Jeff. And we're going to be having a conversation today. Our guest is Jennifer Shuba. Uh, Jennifer is a fellow uh, scholar uh, at the Wilson Center here in Washington, D.C., uh, but she's also a renowned demographer who's worked with the United States Department of Defense, and she's also the author of The Future Faces of War. Today, we're going to be discussing her new book that came out last year, Eight Billion and Counting, How Sex, Death, and Migration Shaped the World. Jennifer, welcome. Thank you so much. Well, let's just first start this conversation because you have a very intriguing career, a demographer. Mm -hmm. Why did you become a demographer? So I think it started um, with an interest in population, even as probably a middle schooler who was focused on environment. You know, this idea that we need to look out for the earth, that, got, that caught on for me very early. And population is a huge part of that, of course. And so when I was in college, um, I studied international relations because I was a Tom Clancy reader. And so I thought, you know, Cold War baby and let me get into this. And kind of swimming in my mind was, is there something that causes war and peace and poverty and development that are really these underlying conditions, not just the, the things we might read about in, in the textbook? And at that same time, um, on one particular day, my favorite professor came to class late and she paused in the doorway to the class, wanting us to look at her, which we did. And when she was there, she was wearing a black armband. And then she just started marching military style in front of our desks. And she said, today world population has hit 6 billion people. Mm. And this is just an absolute travesty for our world. I never had children. There's too many people and you shouldn't either. Which is, you know, not something you could say these days as a college professor. And I was really intrigued by that and skeptical also. Mm -hmm. And so as I went to graduate school as a political scientist, and so my PhD is in political science, I remained really interested in population as the foundation of our world. I mean, people are, they're our workers, they are our soldiers, they're our consumers. Mm -hmm. And so I have tried in my career to take my formal training in political science, but add in a deeper understanding of population. And mm -hmm. so as I was working on my dissertation, I went to the Max Planck Institute for Demographic Research in Germany mm -hmm. and really just tried to learn about that and follow that and bring those together in an interdisciplinary study of mm -hmm. how population makes the world tick. Mm -hmm. What is so interesting in the book, you, you, you actually talk about three things. You talk about the issue around fertility, you talk about the issue around mortality, and then you also then get into this whole issue of migration, mm -hmm. right? And you know the theme of the Jeff this year is literally power climate action energizing 8 billion lives. Yeah. Now, as I was reading the book, I kept thinking to myself, well, do we understand the 8 billion lives we would like to energize? So let's start from the beginning of the book. Give us the context of how fertility mm -hmm. links to population. Sure. So, you know, any population change is driven by those three building blocks. And I think what's nice about that is it can help us simplify how we understand things. When I picture fertility, mortality, and migration, I see them as these dials that are just turned up or down to produce different outcomes. So if we're on this fertility dial for a little while, it, it's a powerful one. And I think these days it's probably the most powerful one, I, I would argue that. And um, the number we, we might want to keep in mind is two. And that is what we call our replacement level fertility rate. The average number of children born per woman in her lifetime is, if it is at around 2, 2.1, then we know that population will, um, that, that generation will replace itself. Mm. So what's interesting about that number is that in the past, um, let's say when we were at a world population of 3 billion, for example, that 
most of the countries in the world were well above replacement level. So what we had in the last century was exponential population growth from 1.6 billion at the start of that century to 6.1 billion by the end. And fertility was really high uh, in a lot of places. Right now, and I'm sure that everyone here, if you pick up any news article, it's just absolutely covered with the uh, news about low fertility. Mm -hmm. So we have a spreading around the world below replacement fertility, which means that over time, deaths outnumber births, mm -hmm. and therefore, eventually, uh, populations will shrink. And so fertility is really powerful for shaping overall size of a population, mm -hmm. but also the age composition, which is fascinating as well and, and gives us plenty to talk about. So uh, those populations that have low fertility, over time, they grow older and older on average. Mm -hmm. So so that's the fertility aspect of it. So let's get into the mortality rate yeah. because there seems to be something we can come back to talk about the divide between the you know different parts of the world, which is I was reading the thing about, you know, the energy divide is almost parallel with the population divide where energy access is less, you have greater population, where energy access is greater, you have a shrinking of population. But let's talk first about mortality mm -hmm. because there seems to be this not necessarily correlation between more people being born, few people dying, vice versa. Right. Talk about mortality. So if we're on that second dial, it's also been incredibly important. Um, but I think we're, I'm going to argue here in a second that it's maybe less important these days in shaping things than, than fertility is. But population change follows this general pattern where uh, before a society has high levels of development, fertility and mortality are both pretty high. Mm -hmm. And what we see is that at the start of something called the demographic transition, mm -hmm. mortality starts to fall first. You mm -hmm. just do a better job of getting people to live, particularly out of childhood. Mm -hmm. You know, get, have, when those babies are born, they will start to live into adulthood. So mortality starts to fall first in that first stage of the demographic transition, mm -hmm. and then fertility follows that. So when we think about that huge population explosion from last century, that in large part was due to a change in mortality and how much we really came to understand and get power mm -hmm. over disease and death um, that allowed so many more people who are born to actually live into adulthood. You know, I think today, uh, you know, this is debatable, but I think today mortality, we have a pretty good understanding of how to get people who are born to live into adulthood. That does not mean that it happens everywhere. So that, that's one aspect of this, of course. And those places where people don't have great access to energy are, of course, the places where, you know, 5,000 children die a day of diarrheal disease. You know, mm -hmm. we could be doing much better on that. Mm -hmm. The knowledge is there, but the implementation may not be. Mm -hmm. So I think when we talk about the power of that mortality dial today, mm -hmm. we are talking more about end of life mm -hmm. and how to... Uh, you know, get people not to die prematurely of non-communicable diseases. So for the first time ever, it's non-communicable diseases like heart disease and cancer that are the major killers worldwide, mm -hmm. not communicable diseases, even with COVID. And I think that's that's interesting and, and it really means that we're just living longer. Yeah. So so we've gotten over we've gotten past the issue of the fertility, we've talked about the mortality. Now, before we get to migration, which is a big mm -hmm. part of the book, uh, I want to come back and just look at some countries, right? Let's just talk about that. So today, the hot topic is Japan, yeah. right? Uh, and we're seeing the sort of the shrinking of the Japanese population. Uh, on the other side, we see Nigeria, right. where you have this vexing, explosive population. What's the difference between those two countries in, in terms of the population transition, if you may? Japan is a great case for us to talk about um, because they are leading the way in this demographic transition, seeing it over time. They're the oldest country in the world population-wise. So if we lined everyone in Japan up from the youngest person to the oldest person, we asked that middle person to raise their hand, they would be almost 50 years old. Hmm. So we look at where's the center of gravity of that population age-wise, hmm. and it is much older. And that's because Japan's fertility fell well below replacement level early, and it stayed there. Mm 
And at the same time, of course, people live quite long in Japan. They have the record life expectancy. So that, of course, would mean that your average is higher because people are living a long time. Mm. Nigeria, we have nearly the opposite. Mm -hmm. uh, if we at lined everyone in Nigeria up from youngest to oldest and we asked the middle person to raise their hand, they'd be about 18 years old. Mm. So it is one of a, only a few, but a few important countries in the world where women still have on average five or more children in their lifetimes. Mm. And so Nigeria's population has doubled and will keep doubling um, as they stay on this path of high fertility. And in fact, even if fertility comes down, so I think this is important when you're talking about projecting future energy needs, even if fertility falls, there are so many people, um, so many young people today who will be aging into their reproductive years that you have what's called population momentum mm. that will keep that a growing country for decades and decades and decades to come. Hmm. It's interesting. So we got Nigeria, we got uh, we got uh, Japan. Two other interesting countries to look at. One's China, mm -hmm. right, in terms of demographics. And the other one is the one we're in right now, the United States. Talk about their population trends, if you may. So China has really made the news in 2023 for its historic turn towards depopulation. And, you know, if you read the media, it's, it's newsworthy because it feels like a surprise to people whose job it may not be to follow demographic trends, but you can even read Chinese policy documents. And 40 years ago, the central party was anticipating population aging. Mm. I think that's notable as well. So China is a huge country. It's one of our demographic giants. It will remain one of our demographic giants. I think that's an important thing to put on the table, even as it shrinks, and even if it shrinks as much as Right now, if, if fertility stayed the same as it is, by the end of this century, China will lose 800 million people. That is a lot. That is if nothing changes. By the end of this century. Yes, by the end of this century, which I don't often project out that far. Mm -hmm. But it's actually a useful exercise when you can say, if nothing changes, this is what happens. And then, of course, policymakers, it's their job to say, well, what might we change? So, Or what can we try to change? That's a different uh, part of this. So China's gonna still be huge, mm -hmm. even in the future. Um, and, but China is one of over 30 countries that actually have shrinking populations. And I'm not sure how widely known that is, that this is not, um, this is kind of where we're all headed. Mm. I think much as Japan is important to follow because they're really leading the way in terms of their aging and shrinking, we can think about China the same way. But the US is different. And we're different because of that third dial. So I don't want to you know, jump ahead on migration, but it makes a difference. So the United States <laughs> has below replacement fertility as well, about 1.6 children born per woman on average. And um, we have many places in, in the country, I think something like 70% of US counties last year had more deaths than births. Mm. So the deaths versus birth thing is the same here as it is in many other places. And in fact, we have a, an issue with mortality as well because the United States uh, is an exception, not in a way that I like, uh, that our life expectancy was already declining pre-COVID. That's not really something that should be happening in a country with living standards as high as ours. Mm -hmm. But we continue to be an incredibly attractive destination for migrants worldwide, even with the political the political nature of that mm. um, to the extent that that continues. So here we are with a policy choice, right? Mm -hmm. To the extent that that continues, it does make up for the low fertility and it does keep the U.S. population continuing to have positive growth mm -hmm. in the decades to come. It's interesting. You know, what is intriguing by the book, and if you haven't read it, I recommend you do because you will learn a lot about just where the world is headed. Migration. Mm -hmm. Very interesting. You talk about, in some cases, it doesn't make logical sense when you look at how migration patterns are and the expectations. So you hear the media saying migration is a big thing, too many immigrants. But in the book, you talk, you say basically it's like only 2% of the world's population no. are living in communities where they were not born. Yeah, just 2 to 4% has been steady for decades and decades and decades. Doesn't feel like that when you read the news. No, it doesn't. No. <laughs> so 
So talk about, you know, what's different now with migration compared to the past? I mean, in the book, you talk about the situation in Europe sure. with, you know, Europe being, I guess, 80, 80, 80 million migrants, something in Europe. And then you have Saudi Arabia. So just talk about the demographics in, um, in terms of migration in different parts of the world. What are some of the key takeaways? Sure. So I think the the thing about migration that does cause such a splash in the media is that they're not evenly dispersed around the globe. So at that global level, it's just two to 4%. It means most people stay where they're born country-wise. But when people do leave, they tend to go to the same places over and over again, such as the United States. And so part of it is the fact that data-wise, they really are in, in different, um, they're, they're not evenly spread around the world. But then I think a large part of it is also perception. Mm -hmm. And that's important with demographics in general. And, and that might be something we could talk about later, but mm -hmm. it's how people feel about where their population is, is often more powerful than the actual numbers. Once population numbers get taken into the political arena, they tend to get used by all the different sides for their own political gain. Um, I'm actually working on a book about that, about the politics of demographic distortion with a couple of co-authors um, that should come out in couple of years uh, oh, because you it's said, powerful. You said a couple of years. I was going to say, can you, pr can you promise to come here first and I'll talk about here. it? Yeah, if we're, if we're all still here, <laughs> I'll be back to talk about that. Okay. Yeah. No, but go back. I mean, I started yeah. the, no, the migration piece. So the migration piece. And, and when we think about how can we project migration, you know, you read the media. And in fact, actually, I think politicians really believe this also. I think they, they believe you can't predict it. And it's a total surprise. So everything is a crisis. The word migration and crisis, they just seem to go together always. It's a crisis because of uh, an unwillingness to plan for it, but it's not really a surprise. We mm. know that these events like natural disasters or economic disaster or even crime drive people out in large waves over and over again mm. in the same way and there's just not a lot of political will to deal with that. And I'm not just talking about the United States. This is really globally. Mm -hmm. um, we want to project migration. The safest thing we could do to, to hedge our bets is say, it'll look a lot like the past. Mm -hmm. And it remains political. So it's not as if countries are going to be taken over by migration mm -hmm. because politics is an effective gatekeeper. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Before I want to go and talk about the practical use of demography uh, or demographics, if you may, in the context of climate and even energy, which is the theme of this conference. Mm -hmm. I want to talk about migration even within a country. Sure. And in the book, you talk about urbanization mm -hmm. and what I will call sustained ruralization because mm -hmm. there are people, most of them realize it, most of the world still live in urban communities, right? Just talk about how urbanization is shaping up and Maybe maybe just say a few words about mega cities and something I learned from the book I didn't know, meta cities. Right, right. You know, urbanization isn't is a puzzle in some ways from a research perspective, mm. which I think is it can be difficult when you're trying to understand things, especially like energy use. I mean, that that that's that would be problematic from from that standpoint. We know some general things, even though many people would talk about the problematic aspects of cities. They're, they can be very crowded. Um, a city in a low-income country feels and looks different and has different opportunities than in a, a wealthy country. On the whole, people tend to want to move from rural to urban areas. Not everyone, and not everyone will. So we think of a place as being saturated in terms of its urbanization when it's looking at like 70 and 80% urbanized. It's not going to probably get more urbanized than that. But there are lots of areas in the world where they've not hit that point. So um, to give to paint with broad brushstrokes, Asia and Africa continentally will be places we would expect to continue to urbanize because as of now, they haven't hit those points. And I think what our research does show so far is that people continue to move there as long as they think, so back, we're back to some perception here, life is better there than it is in the rural areas. And generally it is. There's more access to job opportunities, mm -hmm. educational opportunities, uh, even fun, and meeting a mate. And so 
I would expect that to continue in the future. I want to talk about those big cities, though, city size. Mm -hmm. I think one of the things that's a little bit hard to wrap our brains around with urbanization, though, is that you know, I'm from a town in Georgia, I'm sure everyone can hear the southern accent, that had, had and has no stoplight and is metro Atlanta. And I raised goats as a child. So I am an urban product, but that doesn't look anything like Washington, D.C. or you Tokyo. Know, sh yeah, shiny cities in Singapore, et cetera. So I think it's nice to be able to have the opportunity. And in the, the book, I was able to do so to say, how does each country even define urban? Mm -hmm. um, because it's not necessarily mean city so much. Mm -hmm. And so I think we'll see much more of, when we, when we see urbanization, yes, we'll continue to see more and bigger cities, but also don't just picture cities when you think urbanization. Just think people being more concentrated together. So if we tie this to climate, um, you know, we in the book you mention refugees, mm -hmm. right? You talk about that uh, unfortunate situation. So how could climate change impact demographic, especially in the context of migration? So migration has been one of the responses that people use to adapt to climate changes. And I would say that, you know, since since the beginning of time, we have, you know, centuries ago, people would experience famine, they would experience drought, they would, um, you know, have floods, and they, when able to do so, would potentially move mm -hmm. in order to adapt to those changes. And it's really quite similar today. Hmm. So... We often see that kind of migration happening just to a, somewhere close by. If it is a long-term environmental change, like the kinds that come from, you know, climate change over time, we will we would expect to see people move permanently. Some people, mm -hmm. again, it's, not everybody can move. Not everybody wants to move. Yep. Not everybody can move. Not everybody has somewhere to go because, again, it's still political. When it, we have sudden natural disasters, which also can intensify from climate change, people might move and come back. Yeah. But you can even think about, I'm sure everybody knows, knows some people, maybe they're aging parents or something. Um, you know, sometimes you live somewhere in the U.S. where the environment around you changes, the social environment or the physical environment. And you think, why don't you move? Why don't you move? And I said, well, no, I just don't want to. So mm -hmm. don't forget, I think it's important for, for all of us to remember that mm -hmm. Even when we track climate change over time, we track those trends, don't just assume it leads to some of these migration numbers that we see out there in the media mm -hmm. uh, because there's a lot more to why people move than that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and you know, we'll get into the, I will tie it back to electricity and energy shortly, but I want to get more into the demographics aspect of this conversation. You talk about composition. Mm -hmm. That, you know, you say the age demographics and within that context, you talk about the factors that determine that demographic. It's not just the, the number, it's the composition, yeah. it's the culture. Talk a little bit about that. I think it's important. You know, if we're talking generally, I think that's, that's, there seems to be a tendency for everybody in the world to want to differentiate themselves from other people. We're talking at the group level. We see that happen with demographics as well. Hmm. Um, the project that I've been able to work on at the Wilson Center this year is, it's an even longer term book project, so I don't know where we'll be when this comes <laughs> out. But it's looking at the history of the United States um, through a population lens. Hmm. And what's been remarkable with that is I can find a Life Magazine story from you know, 50 years ago, or I could find a newspaper story from 100 years ago about um, different ethnic or racial groups, about immigration and natives, and it feels like I am looking at something that could have been published this week. Wow. And the same thing really happens everywhere. So composition is important in terms of not just age composition, mm -hmm. which really is important, and that's my, my favorite topic to think about. Um, who in the society is uh, needs education? You know, what proportion mm. of that? We're talking about Nigeria. You know, if half the, the population's under 18, a lot of needs for education versus who might have aged out of the workforce and have a lot of health care needs at the, it, towards the end of their lives, like many countries in Europe, for example, or who might have the bulk of the population <clears throat> in those prime working ages. But then we layer on that um, 
some ethnic and racial composition, and that's where we really see things start to get political everywhere around the world. Hmm. Yeah, and look, so so we've talked a little bit about the climate change and migration piece. Um, you know, just share a few light on this issue of perspective, or per perception, not yeah. perspe perception, right? Um, because as we design energy systems, how we perceive the world, yeah. And how we perceive our customers and what they will do, the choices they will make, will impact what we do. So talk about how important it is for us to understand demographics and the perspectives we should bring to it when we start applying demographic trends, which is your expertise, to designing future energy systems. So I think what's useful in this case is that demographics just becomes one of many types of data. So what we might do here is, is zoom out to how do any of us think about and use data to inform our work. And I think that there are some traps that we all fall into mm -hmm. with data. And, and I can use demographics as an example of that. So one of the traps that we fall into is a tendency to assume that whatever the trend is, that it continues. And, and here's an example of that. So you think back to the story I told about the six billion with the day I learned of this. This would be 1999. I was a fresh undergraduate. And my professor, given her age, she first learned about demographics in the birth of the U.S. environmental movement. So we're talking in the 1960s and then kind of into the 70s. These were her formative years of demographics. And People might think to themselves right now, take a pause and say, you know, how old was I? What year would it have been when I first thought maybe this is important? And it, maybe it's right now. And I talk to a lot of audiences who want to really um, talk about population growth. And this sounds bad, but I can kind of look and think, how old is this person? And when did they first form their, their opinions? Because at the time Paul Ehrlich wrote The Population Bomb, 1968, mm -hmm. huge splash there uh, were 125 countries out of our 200 and some plus where women had five or more children on average. When I learned about uh, the six billion and, and it really started to come to me, there were about 38 countries and now there are eight. So th with data and perception, we have to constantly update ourselves on the trends. Mm -hmm. People don't necessarily have the time to do that. That's why people like me write these books. So you can just read the book and you're good on your demographic <laughs> data, but make sure we put out another edition in a few years because things change. Mm -hmm. So update and understand that things change. Um, I think there's also, we need to understand that trends work in tandem and they work in context. Okay. So you can't just say, ah, demography is destiny. I mean, that's why I love being a political scientist who uses demographics mm -hmm. because I know that politics matters. Mm -hmm. So that same trend in two different places could have two different outcomes. And that's because all kinds of factors matter. I, I, political institutions like democracy or non-democracy, that matters. Uh, Japan's aging and China's aging mm -hmm. are gonna look different because they have very different political systems. Mm -hmm. And then third, I think we wanna think about our biases that we mm -hmm. bring to the data. So. I see this a lot um, in the national security sphere where I've, I've worked. Uh, as the United States wants to see itself as the most powerful country in the world. I think many of our peers want to see themselves as the most powerful country in the world. So there's a tendency to look through that lens mm -hmm. at the data. I think that really has happened with China and Russia. As the U.S. looks at those countries, I know that at the time that I was at the Department of Defense uh, in the mid-aughts, Russia was going through its some tremendous depopulation, mm. like losing up to 600,000 people a year. And there were all these headlines about their uh, alcoholism and high mortality and, and low fertility. And there were articles by high ranking military people and influential minds <laughs> who said, we don't need to worry about Russia from a military standpoint because their demography is their destiny. And then people like me, and there were very few of us to say, that's not how it works. And here we sit today uh, with Russia saying, continuing to have demographic 
I almost never say disaster, but I think right now, I, I actually, I'll say demographic disaster mm. and continues to push. Mm. And so I would say there's a warning about looking at China's depopulation through the same lens. Mm. But what desires are you bringing to the data? Do you see what you want to see? Mm. Or confirmation bias even, when you look at this, does it confirm what you already think? Mm -hmm. So, you know, I want to just practically, this is an audience watching this around the world, uh, leaders from the energy sector, the electricity industry, but other industries, right? So why should we care? Why should our industry care about demographics as we look to energize 8 billion people and counting? And counting. Why should we care about demographics? So you can kind of tell me this. I'm guessing you want to anticipate where the greatest needs will be and what they'll be like, right? I think demographics is, if you are ignoring demographics, you will never have a complete picture of the future. Mm. You absolutely have to include it. Then of course, the political scientist to me says, that better not be the only thing that you're looking at, mm -hmm. of course. So when we are looking at the world today, we've really never been more divided demographically. This is kind of what we were starting to talk about at the beginning. Mm -hmm. I mean, when you look at the 8 billion of us, there are the oldest societies on the planet that we've ever had, thinking about Japan, but not just Japan. I mean, we're moving towards this in much, many other parts of Asia, in Europe, et cetera. And then continuing uh, young and growing populations in other areas. And so we need to understand that the needs of those populations are really different. And they're, out of our 8 billion, 6 billion, are in low and middle income countries. And I think that's probably the mo of the most use as you think through this. And what's interesting about that six billion, it's like we keep peeling back layers of the onion here, they have really varied demographic trends as well. You know, I don't know how commonly known it is, but the number of new entrants to India's workforce yearly, so if we just took those ages 15 to 17, mm -hmm. that already peaked. Oh, wow. That happened last decade. Hmm. But we think about India as one of the eight countries that will really drive us from eight to nine billion between now and, and mid-century. And that is because of kind of, as I mentioned with Nigeria earlier, the population momentum. It's baked in from the past. But India actually has below replacement fertility. So I think as you anticipate energy needs, part of it is counting people, of course. Now, how, how many people will there be? But then where will they be? Mm. So we do know that the number of shrinking countries, it's, it's growing. Uh, two out of every three people of our 8 billion live somewhere with below replacement fertility. Mm. That is a sea change in global population trends. So what we look like globally at 8 is not what we will look like at 9 or 10. But our, the question that, that the energy industry has is the same as many other industries have which is how much will standards of living rise among that six billion in low and middle income countries? Mm. Demographics is part of this because it's actually good news economically when we see fertility falling. We know from the past that when fertility falls, we've generally seen better educated populations mm -hmm. and an opportunity, not a guarantee, but an opportunity for those populations, for those countries to really grow the economy, something called the demographic dividend that mm -hmm. we've seen worldwide. So of that six billion, you know, there are some countries within that that if they play their cards right, mm -hmm. they'll see that big economic growth. For They should have a lot more energy needs and a lot more consumption. So, so more or less than it's seeing demographics as a, almost like a resource. Mm -hmm. And because you talk in the book about, you know, you know, how do you harness the information you've gathered? So from a public policy standpoint, a lot of the listeners here, energy leaders and others, you know, take their clues from the policymakers. Right. So let's talk from a public policy perspective. You're a political science expert. Uh, what should energy leaders around the world, meaning not the ones who are running the businesses, but more the policymakers. Mm -hmm. Right. How should they. What should they glean out of this conversation in terms of we want to energize the world, get to a billion people. The first conversation at this, Jeff, with another influential mind was on the theme of 
the asymmetricity, the asymmetry around uh, universal access. Oh yeah. Right. Uh, and so we had that conversation on Monday, and and then we followed that up with a conversation talking about uh, you know the world as we know it uh, with uh, you know the author uh, Rana Farua from uh, CNN. And so now we're talking about demographics, getting more specific, right? So how should an energy policymaker understand the importance or the significance of demographic change as we design public policy? So I think you were right to phrase it as a resource. And that that's really important because I think the reason there's so much hand-wringing over low fertility these days is that national leaders, and by leaders, I don't just mean politicians, I mean business leaders, very much worry about a, a society's ability to continue to flourish as it moves along that demographic transition towards much older ages and a shrinking population. But I will keep coming back to demography is not destiny, and we have to think about resource. With a resource, you've got to use it. It means, and with population, you have to invest in it. Mm -hmm. That really looks the same in some ways, whether or not you are Nigeria or Japan. How do you invest in your society to, to get the most out of it? Mm -hmm. And of course, I'm being very instrumental about population here, pretending like we're not all indi individuals. Mm -hmm. But education is huge. You want to make the most of your population. Nigeria has to invest in education. But then so does Japan. That can look a little different. Mm -hmm. If we are uh, thinking about retirement ages, we have, in fact, by the end of this century, worldwide, just, the, just from age 65 to 75, there'll be 800 million 65 to 75 year olds. Are they going to be in the workforce or not? Mm -hmm. That's partly a political question, partly a cultural question, but then have they had opportunities for continued education and retraining mm -hmm. or not? I mean, there's a huge resource. I think those companies and those countries that invest in older workers and find more flexible ways to bring them into the workforce after traditional retirement ages, they will succeed. Hmm. And, and other countries and companies that do not do so are squandering the resource. Hmm. And health is the other. Hmm. You're only as, as good as, as how healthy your population is. Hmm. So I think about those 75 or 65 to 75 year olds the 800 million of them at the end of the century, are they healthy enough to work? And in many cases right now, if things continue as they are, they would not be. And that even includes in the United States, hmm. where we are not doing a great job of making sure that people have what's called a long, healthy life expectancy. Hmm. Uh, France, Greece, Spain, those folks, they tend to live up to decades. Uh, in good health after retirement. The countries in our peer group in the U.S., um, as far as healthy life expectancy and how healthy do people, how many years of good health do people have after retirement, mm -hmm. we can put together Russia, China, Romania, Mexico, and the U.S. are in a group together where it's only 10 to 11 years. Hmm. So that really squanders the ability of your population to be a resource for you. So hmm. education and health are two of the important investments that every country needs. You know, you know, two other topics being discussed this week at the Jeff. One has to do with workforce, hmm. uh, and and the other one has to do with critical minerals. Okay. Right. Both things sort of relate to resource consumption or the need for resource. Right. So talk a little bit about. You know, in terms of it, because in the book, you know, in the chapter where you talk about the future of global population, you talk about how, you know, you say people either look at a problem inside out or outside in. Yeah. And and so from a decision making perspective, can you describe different approaches to the problem solving around demographic inside out, outside in? How can we take that into consideration as we design the future workforce? Oh, for the energy industry? That's a great question. I, I love this inside out, outside in part of this because, you know, I originally started my working career around demographics thinking about forecasting. Mm. And so the inside out, outside in, I take straight from Philip Tetlock as we think about pre predicting the future. And so he gives this great example, um, and then I'll give you a population example of being at a wedding. Let's say you and I were at a friend's wedding and we're watching them have their first dance and and maybe I turn to you and I say, what do you think the chances are that they get divorced? 
Well, if we're looking at them, they look so in love on that dance floor. <laughs> we would just say, well, very low. And that, it would actually be rude if you said that you thought they were going to get divorced. But if we have this kind of outside in perspective, we might we look at baseline rates for divorce for their group. And then we would add to that, though, what do we know about them? Do we know, like, do they fight all the time and they barely made it to the altar? <laughs> so we want to marry both the inside out and outside in uh, mm. perspectives with this. And we want to keep updating. And I think that gets to, to something I mentioned earlier with my professor and me. And, I, and I'm constantly surprised by new data. Keep trying to learn about this. Uh, he, and here's a population example as you plan for the future. Let's go back to Nigeria. Mm -hmm. I was pulling some numbers recently about where will Nigeria's population be number wise just in 2040. That's really not that far in the future when you consider that a lot of the mothers are already born. OK, so this is the nice thing about demographics. We follow fairly predictable patterns and a lot of the people of the future are already born. So you want to understand about the workforce. You can kind of go ahead and get some numbers because go to go to the kindergarten classes like that's your future workforce. OK. Mm -hmm. And then some. So I was looking at how different the projections were for Nigeria's total population in 2040. And I took two projections. One is the UN's medium variant. That's the one you read any news article. They're using that one. And basically, the UN just says, here's the universe of projections. And we've just, here's the one in the middle. And then I said, what if nothing changes? And I pulled what they call their constant fertility variant. Mm -hmm. The difference was, you know, tens of millions of people based on whether or not fertility falls by a child and a half. Hmm. So if you are looking at that medium variant for the United Nations and you're looking at Nigeria's population less than two decades in the future, that medium variant assumes fertility there will fall by a child and a half per woman on average. Now, we want to understand this. We need to say, what has happened historically with other countries? Does it tend to fall at that rate? Botswana, it fell faster than that. Some places it hasn't fallen nearly as fast as they thought it would. Mm -hmm. And then you need to ask some questions about Nigeria itself. Do you think that the leadership takes seriously the need for education and rights-based family planning and you know ending child marriage mm -hmm. so that it would lead to a situation where fertility falls that fast? or not. Mm. And so when you think about the future workforce, think about the kinds of investments being made today to understand the characteristics of that workforce in the future. Mm. Look, so uh, we, we, I think we have, uh, I guess, 10, 15 more minutes, but I just want to get into one very important thing. So climate power action is, or are the three words that sort of a surmise this 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 conference this week and one of the things that's come up with them is making predictions mm -hmm. and projecting into the future so the energy industry climate advocates governments all make projections about what we should do what we shouldn't do regarding climate the actions and in the book you talk about desirability bias yeah. so we have a lot of goals that have been set for the world in terms of climate. We have a lot of goals being set by business leaders watching this uh, this this, uh, this conversation. Um, and we have a lot of goals set as individuals. Mm -hmm. So talk about desirability bias and how might that affect how we energize the world? Oh, now we're getting into the, the juicier part of this, I think. So, so I'm gonna ask you a little bit about this. What do you think that most of your leaders would desire to see the most maybe trends in s sustainability of resource use for example or uh you know total re uh, energy use so i think when i talk to executives around the world i think many almost all of them recognize that something needs to be something needs to be done around you know the vexing challenges around climate change I think they all want to get the transition going. I think they also want it to be done in a way that's fair, mm -hmm. equitable, affordable, and it's important. Yeah. But they also want it to be done in a way that the public policies that are brought to bear are those that not only enable the building of the necessary infrastructure, but that enable the transition 
to be done in a way that doesn't uh, create uh, uh, inefficiencies or inequalities yeah. more. So those are sort of, if I should, I mean, it would differ from executive sure. to executive, but if I will take all of their views together, those are the sentences I will use to describe what they would desire. So I think as we start to interrogate that then, what we might want to do is say, how much on the path are we for that? Okay. Which I think a lot of people, you know, I, I might be someone who says there's a desire to, among some groups to see uh, more sustainable energy use. If we look at the immediate trends, not everywhere in the world are we leading towards more sustainable use. Mm -hmm. So I think that what, checking ourselves on our desirability bias is saying, make sure when you really take a hard look at the data that you're not seeing what you want to see in it. I think some people who are, are in an industry, um, in a particular sector where they will benefit mm -hmm. if you are headed down that trend are gonna tell you the story that we are headed on that trend. Mm. And that may not actually be true. Mm. But then I think we could also, um, sometimes our desires do come true. I think there's a lot of opportunity to, you know, I think about India, for example, and uh, commercial electric vehicle usage, for mm -hmm. example, uh, technology. I mean, this is, we haven't mentioned technology yet, but, but this is something, we're gonna that, get oh, to we got to bring technology into this. So, you know, sometimes our desires, as long as you're aware of what they are, the first step is always make sure you name them before you go into the data and then use that to, to give a really critical look to say, are you actually headed down that path or not? So basically let our desire be brought to bear. Yes. And then we can remove the bias and more succinctly look at the data in terms of understanding are we on the right path or are we not? Because if our desires are driving our decision making, we may actually end up doing the wrong thing. Oh, absolutely. And again, I see this in the national security community all the time. But I think, you know, if you're sitting down together with your, your senior leadership at, at the table and you've got the whiteboard marker, I think the, one of the first things you should do when you open a meeting is say, what do we desire and what do we think? And mm. name those and put them on the whiteboard and then start looking at your trends mm. and make sure that you realize and you, you know, you're constantly referring back. Am I just looking for those? And let me make sure I look for evidence of the opposite as well. Mm. That's a very interesting thing. Makes you wonder how many of the goals we've been setting from a business standpoint in general yeah. have been desire driven yeah. as opposed to something that's real, practical, achievable, and, and, and sort of a grounded in, in the data and grounded in facts. And even our measurements for them. I mean, it's certainly you can measure and say, oh, yes, look how well we did this year on this thing, because that's what you want to see mm -hmm. from the data. Yeah. And maybe that's not, maybe there's data to the contrary as well. Okay, so I saved the best for last mm. in this conversation, almost the best. Okay. Technology. Yes. Let's talk about how technology can basically, because you said, Fertility, mortality, and migration. I would add the fourth one, yeah. which would be technology, since you didn't cover that in the book. Yeah. Give so us an idea fair. on how technology shapes demographics. It is... Or, in, or influences if demographics. I was going to say, so when I think about this, um, this line I kind of gave you earlier, that demography is not destiny, mm -hmm. and that the same trend in two different places have, can have two different outcomes. There are forces in societies, I mentioned, like whether a country is a democracy or not a democracy, that can amplify demographic trends or dilute them. Another one of those forces is technology. Mm. And so as I think a lot about the number of countries, again, the majority of people in the world living somewhere with below replacement fertility, of course, one of the worries that business leaders have in particular is, will they have enough workers? And so what we've seen um, is that that's a great place for technology to come in. Mm -hmm. And it, it has done a lot. I think, again, Japan is a great example of this. When I first started studying population aging 20 years ago, nobody thought that an aged country could continue to be innovative. Mm -hmm. They were like, oh, it's like an aging person. You know, you just have all these cognitive declines and, and you know, you lose all of that. Japan continues to lead in that. And in fact, I think demographic stresses can really push innovation. Yeah. So what we see there is not only do they have, of course, these um, wearable exoskeletons to help people lift more, they also have washing machines for elderly people. Mm. You just wheel somebody in, 
close the door, their head sticks out, so it's okay. And you push the button and it helps. So there are lots of jobs in the world where mm. technology can substitute for labor or it can make us more productive. Because mm. really that's the thing. I think there's a lot of worry about losing numbers of workers mm -hmm. and we've got to shift our mindset to think more about how do we make each of us more productive from mm. an economic standpoint. And of course, technology is there. Technology is key. Yeah, but there's a worry I have with technology as well. Um, so in, in those places in the world with young and growing populations, in the past, that path to economic development, mm -hmm. a lot of it's been manufacturing-led growth. And so you say, our, one of our greatest resources right now is we have tons of young people who could lead us into economic development through their labor. If technology comes in and can substitute for some of that labor, I do have a worry that those young people will not find mm -hmm. the same level of engagement and economic opportunity. Mm -hmm. And I think that could be a problem. We have other political science research that I talk about in the book that says that when people are expecting to basically do better than their parents, mm -hmm. and then those expectations are not met, mm -hmm. there's a much greater likelihood for political instability. So um, in the future, is it going to be the case that sub-Saharan African economies, because they will really be the only populations with lots and lots of young people. Is that going to be their key to economic development or will technology have come in to replace some of that labor? And I think, you know, coming back to what you previously talked about, to harness that demographic dividend in sub-Saharan Africa or other emerging economies, there has to be an investment yeah. in developing the resource, right? So, you know, using that uh, that analogy, so to speak. I want to wrap up, you know, before I get to my wrap-up question, we should be a fire, sort of a fire lightning round talking about the key takeaways. I just want to go back to demographics or population and power. Because mm -hmm. in the book, you give a very interesting analogy where you talk about where people see some leaders. I mean, I think you mentioned Hosni Mubarak, for example, oh, in yeah. Egypt, uh, and you mentioned other leaders. But why do you think some leaders see population growth as a size of power and others may not? You know, I think it is historical because historically speaking, mm -hmm. those big populations, big they, you know, the bigger, the better. Mm. I think we got lots of examples now where that's not the case anymore. Singapore is not large very strong economy, uh -huh. influential in its own ways, for example. Um, it has been hard to shake that population as power, though. Mm. Some of it is people are students of history. So that it kind of, again, what sticks in your mind, mm. uh, it, things are, I, these ideas are sticky over time. Um, I think that there are some leaders in countries with high fertility who are unwilling to invest in the population in a way that could help people have fewer children if they mm. desire to do so because they see population as power. And in fact, I worry that all of the media coverage about China's aging and shrinking population, and we're going to just keep seeing more and more of that South Korea, record low fertility. I really worry that those leaders in countries that have high fertility will be unwilling to invest in ending child marriage you know, uh, spreading education, rights-based family planning, health care, whatever the, the case may be, because they don't want to go down that path. Mm. And I said, well, at least we'll still be young and growing. Mm -hmm. uh, I think that we need to be attuned to that as a possibility. So, so you know, this is midway into the Jeff uh, Wednesday, uh, and we have uh, two more days to go. Um, just help the energy leaders listening to this to understand why each of them should hire a demographer. Why do we need more demographers in terms of designing not just energy systems, but future systems of the world? Why is your profession so important? Because the more I read the book, the more I realized, gee, I should have bought this book two decades mm -hmm. ago because it would have helped me in some of my own decision making from a you know, business standpoint. Why, why is that so important? So I'm happy to come in and do some consulting anytime. <laughs> but I think you have to understand that people are the foundation mm -hmm. of everything. Mm -hmm. We are all your workers. We are all your decision makers. We're your voters, consumers, et cetera. So 
at a very basic level, if you are not including demographics in your analysis of what is now and is to come, mm -hmm. you will never have a full picture of things. Um, but I think it can also enhance your understanding, especially when, you know, as, as we think about future needs, if that's a year from now, three years or decades from now, there's always a range of possibilities. Mm -hmm. And so understanding that that population can help you learn about ranges of possibilities. And when we started by talking about those dials, they mm -hmm. turn up and they turn down. Mm -hmm. Some of it is, uh, you know, demographic trends themselves are influenced by external factors. Yeah. You know, how many children I might end up having may be in part driven by how the economy is doing. Mm -hmm. So I think to get our, uh, as an exercise in understanding the range, mm -hmm. This is a great uh, learning opportunity for us mm -hmm. to, to look at how demographic trends have changed over time, what's likely to change them over time, and then that way you're really having a, a comprehensive uh, understanding of technology, of population, of energy, uh, economic drivers, environmental drivers, all put together to give you a clearer picture of the future. Mm -hmm. And really understanding that demographic composition, which yeah. is something you also talk about. All right, Jennifer, let's wrap this conversation up by just quickly going through your key takeaways okay. towards the end of the book and just, you know, just give us your thoughts on these six little okay. thoughts here. First one, size matters. Why? Size matters really because of perception. So whether or not, you know, it actually matters in the same way that it would have 200 years ago, how many soldiers do you have to field an army, for example, there is still a sticky perception among leaders that the bigger, the better. So it matters because of that perception aspect of that. That means that as we look to the future, those countries like uh, China and India and the United States as the three biggest countries continuing now and in the next few decades, they will still wield lots of regional influence and in some cases, global influence. Okay. People move in somewhat predictable patterns. Why? So places in the world where people might need to move the most or they maybe can't afford to do so. So we know that people tend to move. Um, we can actually draw some some lines in, in the sand there to say that when a country hits certain levels of income, people are actually more likely to move. Mm. And that, that kind of makes sense. Like, did you save up enough to go? It's expensive to move and you need the know how to do it. So we know that there are certain patterns. If you want to project out looking at the world, you know, are the people of Niger likely to be some of the world's, uh, you know, biggest immigrants in the next few decades? No, they're not. They are not likely to be. But mm. as Nigeria's median, a uh, median income rises, perhaps Nigerians would be. Mm. So this is an interesting one. So as we're talking about energizing the world of 8 billion people and counting, yeah. uh, we design energy systems. We have assumptions about where people will live. Yeah. This one, the world is urban. Yes, it is safe for us to say it is a general trend towards urbanization. Now, as we try to nail it down to more specifics, that's a little harder. But when you're designing systems, places that are not saturated in terms of urbanization, they'll continue to urbanize. And so you are going to have to account for those energy needs and plan for those. Okay. Uh, the other one, <laughs> no surprise, an aging world is coming. Yeah, and it's really here. I think... Uh, when we are looking at the world of 9 billion, that is a much older world um, for much of it. Uh, you know, it's really that we're back to this divide here, but with China and India both at the lower placement fertility, mm -hmm. these are two huge countries and they are both aging as well. India is going to keep growing, but their median age is going to be increasing as well. Okay, two more. The one, the ne this next one is very important for this industry. Policies can shape the future we want. Yes. Demography is not destiny. It is incredibly important, and you can't get a, a sense of the present or future without it. But harnessing the power of your population, that comes from investing in things like education, health care, um, and that's throughout people's life courses from young to very old. Mm. So we, 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 we've come to the last one. Before I ask you the last one, I would just put one little punctuation mark on something we didn't talk about. And that is the notion of long-term thinking versus short-term thinking. Uh, earlier this month, we had a conversation with a, uh, a neurosurgeon 
who talked about the importance of understanding brain circuitry, how the brain works. And uh, you begin the book when you talk about the uh, you talk about the the growth, and you talk about the differential growth, yeah. and you describe what we're seeing not so much of a population exponentially growing, but more of a differential growth. Yeah. So, given our mindset, given the fact that we need to think long term, mm -hmm. Blast one says the demographic design or divide, the demographic divide divide will shape the fortunes of countries. Yeah, and it, it it's that one is is an important one to end on. So I'm glad we are. I've been thinking a lot about how, as I shared that population hit 8 billion, and that was the title of my book, two camps of people uh, w would respond to that. One says, how can Earth possibly hold any more people? And I think there's a misunderstanding when we see the overall number of people growing in the world the rate of global population growth has actually been falling since the 1960s. So for the majority of people in the world, they're headed towards these aging and shrinking populations. They will have very different needs and policies in place, um, things they want on the global stage, than those places in the world where fertility is still really high. Um, in parts of sub-Saharan Africa, for example, or Central Asia, the types of things they want to see in the world are going to look really different. So I think we can actually extrapolate from what's happening at the domestic level to how these different sets of countries will interact with one another on the global level as well. How they want to see investment, maybe how they decide to cooperate economically or even have some armed conflict potentially. I mean, it could really spill over into every sphere that will have fundamentally different interests. And I don't know that our global architecture is strong enough to help these divergent interests really come together. And certainly energy is a case study for that, where there are divergent interests among countries around the world. Um, that's going to continue. Well, look, the book was written in 2022, and it was the year we actually hit 8, 8 billion. billion. And I would say to you, you're a fortune teller because you, you came up with the title of the book before we hit 8 billion. So, so Congratulations on that. Eight billion and counting how sex, death, and migration shape our world. Uh, Jennifer Shuba, this has been a delight having this conversation yeah. with you, and you've exposed me to a whole new profession. Uh, being a demographer is something I think we should all at least attempt to do and attempt to understand. So thanks for joining us here Thank at the Global you. Electrification Forum as part of this Influential Minds series. Thank you so much. Thank you for having me. It was a wonderful conversation.